Hi, Tony. Thanks for doing this. Uh, as always, I'm, I'm looking forward to attending my first AW pay-per-view uh, this weekend. Uh, there's a lot of options for venues in the New York metropolitan area, and you've already had great success at the UBS arena right down the road. I'm interested in knowing uh, why Nassau Coliseum, which is a classic old venue, as I know as a native Long Islander and a New York Islanders fan, um, in its own right, was why Nassau Coliseum was chosen uh, for, for this event and what went into that. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great venue. Nassau Coliseum has a lot of pro wrestling history. Also, uh, the greatest ability is availability. And in this case, this is a perfect time of year to host a wrestling pay-per-view. We've had this great year debuting new events. Of course, more importantly and, and bigger than anything, AEW All-In, going to Wembley Stadium and selling the most tickets in the history of pro wrestling and having this incredible event. And we built something really special there. We also added Wrestle Dream, which was something very, very cool. And uh, one of the best events we've ever done and again built a great new tradition with wrestle dream and of course last year forbidden door was a tremendous debut for us and again forbidden door this year incredible and uh, each of the last two years forbidden door arguably has been the best wrestling event of the entire year and now here we are going into our first ever world's end i think we've shown when we add new events we set a high standard and in this case i felt like going into the new york market particularly long island at this time of year would make a lot of sense. I think we've been proven right with the great success of the live event. Nassau Coliseum is a great venue. I've been there before, like you, to see the New York Islanders. I was actually there uh, with friends for the last game the Islanders ever won at Nassau Coliseum in the playoffs. And uh, it's a great venue. We've had great success at UBS Arena. Obviously, uh, there is hockey coming up at UBS Arena, and I think this was really – Kismet. It was fate, and it was uh, a great situation at Nassau Coliseum with its great history of pro wrestling. And uh, for what's going to be a great event this weekend, uh, that we would go there, and this, this is going to be tremendous. I'm really looking forward to World's End, and I'm glad you're going to be there, Phil. And based on the success of the tickets, it's worked out really well for us. And as a pay-per-view, I can promise it's going to be a great show. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> Steve Fall from 10 Count, you are next. Jason Powell from ProWrestling.net will follow Steve. Steve, you're up. Hey, Tony. I'm excited to be there this weekend for the show. And I want to ask about The Devil because this storyline has just taken over AEW. And was this inspired by the Black Scorpion in WCW? Plus, is there a reveal coming up? Because we're all waiting. And, uh, you know, is World End is going to be the place we're going to find out who the actual devil is. Well, it feels like we're getting close to that point, uh, and I do expect some big revelations and big moments at World's End. Uh, it's its own idea, and it's something that I'm excited about. I do feel like it's coming close to the culmination, and it does feel like uh, the secrets will be revealed at World's End, and I'm looking forward to it. It's been very different than the other aspects of AEW, which I think that as I go on here and get into some of these more technical questions. I'm really looking forward to talking about the presentation of AEW recently and what we've done. I think one aspect of it that's been really interesting and uh, has been something to keep people hooked and those people that want to see uh, that kind of episodic story it, and it, it's really something uh, that has got a lot of people talking and I think has built a lot of interest for World End is the identity of the devil in last night, finding out that Samoa Joe is working with the devil, and it's MJF versus Samoa Joe, and I think uh, that twist adds a new layer to it, knowing that Samoa Joe, of course, has been working with the devil in cahoots, but who is the devil now knows that we know it's not Samoa Joe. And uh, very excited for the match. I think last time MJF versus Samoa Joe at Grand Slam was a great match, and now the stakes have been set, and... Uh, the table is there, and uh, we're ready for uh, a great MJF versus Samoa Joe match with different set of stakes. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Jason Powell from ProWrestling.net will come next, and I'm going to follow Jason with a write-in from Kimmy Sokol from The Pop Break. Jason.
All right, sorry about that. It normally does it for me, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to know, how would you label your long-term standing with Warner Brothers Discovery? And do you feel like you have viable alternatives for television partners if you don't end up doing business with them beyond the current deal? Yes, it's a great question. We have a great relationship with Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, it's amazing now. Uh, we've been talking to them for, for several years. You know, this coming weekend marks the five-year anniversary of the launch of AEW. And we announced the formation of the company on January 1st, 2019. And here we are uh, days away from the five-year anniversary uh, of that. And Warner Brothers Discovery has been an indispensable partner throughout this journey. I'm very excited about the future of AEW and excited to work with Warner Brothers Discovery throughout 2024. Uh, and going forward after that, there's going to be a lot of exciting conversations about AEW media rights. It'll be a, a very exciting year, and a lot of things are going to happen. We have a great situation with Warner Brothers Discovery, and it's been a great year for that partnership. I think I'll be talking probably a, a good deal more about Collision on this call and, and, and maybe more about some of the wrestling aspects. But as a TV show, it's had a tremendous year. Recently, it's done very well. And again, I think I'll talk tech, more technical and mechanics about why I think that may be and, and why that's so important. But Collision... Tremendous first year, and that was a big step in the partnership this year to add two more hours of content. And uh, you asked about alternatives. Well, we're under an exclusive agreement, and I can't say what the future of AEW will hold for certain, but I know that uh, there is a lot of interest in pro wrestling, and judging by the market I've had with lots of interest in Ring of Honor, which I'm holding and looking forward to having extra cards uh, to play later uh, in the coming year in such a negotiation. And knowing that there's a ton of interest in ROH and that product right now from outside parties and knowing that there's far, far more interest in AEW, multiple times more, and far greater rights fees out there for AEW in the future, I think it bodes very well in the market knowing that there will likely be a lot of suitors for AEW and following what's happening in pro wrestling. Uh, and we'll find out for sure uh, as we get closer to the end of the year, potentially. Uh, although uh, I have to say, it's really, really great working here at Warner Brothers Discovery. And if anybody came in, it would have to be a heck of an offer because we have a great thing going here. And I would, you know, all things being considered, this is uh, a, a great place to be. So I, I really do value the relationship, and I think it's in a great place. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jason. <clears throat> Tony, I'm going to um, read you a, a questionnaire from Kimmy Sokol from the Pop Break, and then Stu Myrick from Sports Guys Talking Wrestling will follow uh, Kimmy's question, which is, although only securing three points in the Continental Classic, how would you assess Daniel Garcia's performance in the tournament? It's a great question. I think Daniel Garcia tore the house down match after match, and I think what the Continental Classic is all about is having – the best match you can have, putting forth the best effort you can, and trying to get better throughout the tournament. And I think Daniel Garcia came out of the tournament in a far better place than he went in. He's a better wrestler, and I know from talking to him, it's his greatest experience in pro wrestling. He felt like he came out of the tournament a much better wrestler. And for a young star like him, now with so much upside, I think that's so great, and uh, I really love I love that aspect of it, and I think in addition to all the great, all the great matches, all the great stars, and now having a great block final this week, having, having the leagues go on with a blue league final like Eddie Kingston versus Brian Danielson that was one of the best matches ever on Dynamite, one-on-one, -on -one, and then also this incredible three-way match. They were so different from each other, and they were so great, and to have the gold league final with uh, Swerve Strickland versus John Moxley versus Jay White. The same night, it was just two of the best matches ever on Dynamite in the same night, uh, leading into one of our biggest pay-per-views. And I'm really excited for this weekend. I think Eddie Kingston versus John Moxley is a perfect final, and I think both of them throughout the Gold League and the Blue League, respectively, um, really earned these positions, and they have so much history with each other. I think this is going to be such an amazing match. I'm really excited about it. And... Then uh, I have to say, when with Daniel Garcia, he, he 
time after time throughout the tournament uh, demonstrated to me personally and I think to everyone in AEW and to all the fans that he is a force to be reckoned with in the future and uh, that he will be a fixture in AEW, I hope, for a very long time. And as you said, even though he only earned three points in the tournament, there were three very important points in the tournament. And uh, certainly he finished the tournament on a very high note. Thank you. Thank you, Kimmy. <clears throat> Stu Myrick from Sports Guys Talking Wrestling is next. Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics will follow Stu. Stu? Do you do these all the time, man? You're on like every one of these, so. Oh, there he is, uh, Tony. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, given the relationship between you between AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling, I wanted to get your reaction to Hiroshi Tanahashi being named president of New Japan. Well, what a great question! I'm very excited about Hiroshi Tanahashi taking over as the new president of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Wishing the best to Obari-san. Mr. Obari has been a great president. We ushered in the Forbidden Door partnership under his management, and I will always value his contributions. New Japan Pro Wrestling has become such a great international partner for us, and domestically, too. We love working with them all over the world. And given all of our entanglements, I think it makes so much sense to have somebody that AEW has a very close working relationship with and somebody in particular that is respected throughout the New Japan locker room and every wrestling locker room in the planet. And that is Mr. Tanahashi, pun intended, to a T. And personally, I have really valued my experiences working with Tanahashi-san. He's one of the smartest and most prepared wrestlers I've ever produced and worked with on multiple shows. We've had great matches working with him, whether it's John Moxley, MJF, Swerve Strickland, anybody uh, that's gotten in with Tanahashi has had a great match. And I know everybody in AEW respects the hell out of Tanahashi, as does everyone in New Japan. And as I said, pretty much any wrestling locker room in the world, this is one of the most revered professionals, and it's for good reason. He is a great person, a great professional, a great leader, and he's going to be a great leader for New Japan, and I'm very proud to be partners with a company like New Japan Pro Wrestling with a president like Hiroshi Tanahashi. Thank you. I'm back. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. I apologize. All good, Jim. I just I, tried. It was such a good answer about Tanahashi. I thought it was like <laughs> such a mic drop moment that I thought you were really taken no, aback by how I, the I answer was taken was. aback. I, I, I was. Uh, nonetheless, there was also a little bit of a, of, of a technical problem on my end. So with that, I'm going to go with Brandon Thurston uh, with WrestleNomics comes next. And Dominic D'Angelo from Ad Free Shows will follow Brandon. Hi, Tony. Thanks, as always, for your time. Uh, with, with the year coming to an end, I wanted to ask you about uh, TV ratings for AEW. Uh, Dynamite TV ratings and Rampage ratings were down on average in all four quarters this year from their ratings in 2022. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on what the biggest reasons are for that change. I, I think the Dynamite rating in particular held up very well relative to cable. And, in fact, I think the Dynamite uh, – is year over year, uh, isn't Dynamite pretty similar to Raw this quarter? Give, give them a couple percent at most in terms of the year over year. With that, Brandon, by the way, you can unmute Brandon if you want to, because I'll um, gladly. Dynamite is thing. down in Q4 in total viewership 10%, and Raw is down 8%. So, like I said, it's within a couple, it's basically very similar year over year, you would say, Dynamite and Raw this quarter? In, in this quarter, yeah. 
Um, but in, in, okay. in, the demo, so, in the demo, I do uh, think it's been very similar, and I think it's cable in general is down. Obviously, those are the big cable products of both companies uh, year over year historically. Uh, I know it's uh, AW. We've only been around five years, but that has kind of been our flagship show since the beginning. So, you know, you say Raw is down eight percent and Dynamite's down ten percent. I think I was, you know, and I had that off the top of my head pretty much, and. Uh, that's very similar, and both of those are ahead of the decline in cable television. Cable television is down a lot more than 10% year over year. And both of us at Raw at down 8% and Dynamite down 10% are beating the hell out of gravity. And both of us are looking at a big pay raise this year for Dynamite and Raw. And Raw, having made $265 million a year, last year for them to get a pay raise that's going to be a really big number for them and for us it's a lot of money too you know frankly i think it's, it's crazy with sports economics you know you talk about these numbers and it's like you know like 50 million dollars wasn't a lot of money it was a lot of money we were you know we've been getting paid year over year for dynamite and uh it's going to be a lot more for us going forward both shows are, uh, are probably due for a big rights fee increase and frankly percentage wise especially dynamite because of where we start and how we performed so again um those numbers, and it's by the way, I notice people talk about the dynamite one a lot. But you know, eight and ten percent, pretty similar numbers there. You don't hear people talk about the the eight percent as much, do you? And and then if you talk, if people bring up football, I would point out that this is versus last year's quarter, where there was football, and the quarter before, and the quarter before, and every quarter the show's ever been on in Q4 because that's Q4 every year. And uh, I do have some points talking about football though. Uh, when I get to the collision ratings, there's no year-over-year -year collision ratings history. So anyway, so to your point, I think, yeah, I mean, to be 8 to 10% to me is very similar with uh, the drop in cable uh, being m much more than that. And so uh, I think that uh, both shows have done really well to, frankly, defy gravity and stay ahead of the drop, which, uh, as I understand, is closer to 20%. And again, Brandon, uh, you know, if you guys, I'm happy to, to kind of, I, and Brandon, I assume I will see you at the scrum also. So, and I will, and, and I would, and I'm very, very glad to talk, you know, numbers and stuff and have like kind of a, a back and forth on some of these things. Cause I think you're very, very intelligent, articulate and, and, uh, one of the best, uh, read and best research people on this particular subject. And, and, you know, I could learn something from you about it. But I, I think it's fair to say, like, you know, and I, thank you, thanks, Jim, for, for letting Brandon jump back in and, and unmuting him. I, I wanted to, to get that because I was, I was thinking that was about right off the top of my head. Those were the numbers I was thinking were, were about 8 to 10 percent. And I, so I think it's very similar. And, um, I, you know, I think, frankly, I think uh, they would have the same answer that, uh, you know, when they're out in the marketplace trying to make that sale for Raw right now actively in, in that same TV rights marketplace we, we all were just talking about. Uh, that, you know, I think we'd have the same answer there that, that you know, frankly, down 8 to 10% year over year is pretty good when the industry is down far, far more than that. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. <clears throat> Dominic D'Angelo from Ad Free Shows is next. Dave Meltzer from the Wrestling Observer will follow Dominic, who's up now. Hey, Tony, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hey, Dom. Oh. Hey, good, good to talk to you again, Tony. Uh, looking forward to the pay-per-view this coming weekend. Uh, kind of wanted to get a gauge about um, your booking strategy as far as heading into 2024 when it comes to, uh, I know uh, at the All Out conf uh, Media Scrum afterwards, you mentioned how kind of overworked you are and you have Jimmy Jacobs helping you as an assistant and technically and stuff like that. And you doing football and soccer and everything like that. Kind of curious if, you, if you've reconsidered uh, getting some a more of a booking team in order and, and seeing maybe how to delegate some more uh, creative stuff to people uh, behind the scenes a little bit. It's a great question. I mean, we have a great group of people right now in my office. Uh, just as an example, uh, yesterday you had a great group with uh, Brian Danielson, Mike Mansuri, uh, Will Washington, Jimmy Jacobs, Sanjay Dutt, Sarah Stock, uh, and Dean Malenko, and uh, several others uh, that were in my office throughout the day at various points. And Brian had his, his match, and people were in and out. 
Uh, I think everybody had great points, and there were a number of other people. Uh, but I did come in with a lot of it, and I think we've been on uh, an incredible run of shows. And this is a great uh, – this wasn't quite the setup I was looking for, so I'll see if I still get it. Uh, but i very excited to talk about the science of the booking. And I think in particular, uh, it recently we've had some of our best shows we've ever done. And this year, if you look at 2023, and, you know, just to use as uh, – Samples, you know, you can look at uh, fan feedback from different shows. One site that measures fan feedback is Cage Match. Look at the top 100 shows this year and look at how many of them are from AEW. And if you throw uh, this version of ROH in there, too, you get some some more. But uh, it's pretty incredible. And the top 100 shows that have over 50 votes, top 100 shows even more so that have over 100 votes, look at those. And look at how many of them happened in 2023 from AEW or uh, even a couple more from ROH. And uh, that speaks pretty highly, I thought. But uh, much more so, I would talk TV ratings. And I'm really excited about the lift and collision ratings we've seen as the competition has continued to increase. We've seen historically that nothing takes a toll on wrestling ratings more so than the most powerful media empire in the world that is the National Football League, uh, the NFL, I, I speak from experience and from within the beast that it is the most powerful and most efficient and best run media operation in the world. And uh, the NFL in recent weeks has taken the top dozen spots or more on cable on Saturday, just the NFL. And uh, yet the collision ratings have continued to increase. And I do think there is a science behind this methodology, and I do think they've been probably the strongest set of shows we've ever done consecutively. And I, uh, so I, I think there's a great team, but also I personally have never felt more invigorated and on top of the booking. There's a great group of people on Saturdays and Wednesdays, and that was a good sample of people uh, that were there, and I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting uh, a couple people. And then there's people that weren't there that you know might be there on a Saturday. Um, but there was a lot of people throughout the day uh, that would come in and, and contribute an idea. Um, and uh, certainly uh, I, I felt com coming in really prepared in recent weeks. You know, something I've really enjoyed has been the Continental Classic. And again, you didn't give me the perfect setup to talk about this stuff. Uh, so I, uh, I might come back to it. But uh, I've been conducting some pretty experimental booking. And I really enjoyed the science of it, and I can break down the science of it going into World's End and why I think there's a lot to learn from it. And uh, I think uh, I might as well now that I've popped the can off it, I'll just keep talking. So uh, I think it's really interesting because uh, when you do an experiment, there's an experimental group and a control group. And for me, the control was everything we had been doing. And I took basically the things I've been doing and tried to keep them consistent. And uh, then began doing the experiment that was the Continental Classic. And uh, the nature of it is a very sports-based presentation. And it has some changes from uh, the G1, for example, which in this case I would say the scoring system of three points for a win versus two makes it uh, a very different incentive to go for the wins. And also, I think the biggest difference possibly is nobody allowed at ringside and no outside interference. And that's probably a misconception from people who don't actually watch the G1 uh, because uh, there has been outside interference. And I think that was something we did to, to make it different. And... Then when I look at the tournament itself and executing it, it's the most fun I've ever had working on something. I love working on the Continental Classic, and I think I'm, it's been so tremendous and such a highlight of the holidays. For me, it really put a smile on my face on Christmas, going back and watching some of it with my family, and I think uh, being able to watch the very best of AEW and show them what we're doing. And... For the Continental Classic final this weekend, I think Eddie Kingston and John Moxley, there's so much story between the two men, and I thought the face-to-face -face segment at the end of the Brian Danielson-Eddie Kingston match, which many people felt was the 
culmination of the entire tournament so far, the best match yet. It was tremendous. So when you do an experiment, you have an experimental group and a control group. If the control is what we've been doing and, and the things that have been on AEW and what we're doing, the experiment was uh, increasing uh, the allocation of this very meat and potatoes, sports-based, old-school pro wrestling at its finest, in my opinion, Continental Classic. And the experiment, I think, has been very successful, and it has yielded really interesting results. And one thing I would point to in particular is that ratings increase on Collision, because Collision probably leaned into being a bit more sports-based presentation to begin with, and now with the additional Continental Classic content, I think what we've been able to do and what I focused on with the booking of Collision that I think has probably been the best set of shows we've ever had and has really yielded positive, uh, tangible results on paper that I can show now with the ratings increases in the recent weeks, despite the competition getting much harder, because there is, unlike other shows, there's no history uh, of Collision, not only year over year, because this is the first year, but then there's no history of Collision versus the NFL. So you can't really go back and look at what the NFL has done to Collision before because there's never been Saturday NFL competition versus Collision in this being the first year. What we've seen is we were able to boost the ratings against the toughest competition of the year, which if you look at the history of the NFL and wrestling, that's really hard to do. That's how good these shows were. That's how successful this experiment was. That's how strongly I feel about what we've done with the Continental Classic. And going forward, will this affect the presentation and will I – book the shows, more sports-based presentation, and accept the fan feedback, which is very tangible and real. Yes, absolutely. And that is why this has been such a great experiment, uh, and the results are there. They are tangible. Uh, there's been, as I've said, an experimental group and a control group. The experiment increasing the allocation of real, real quality pro wrestling. And by the way, then in doing so on Collision, a show that was already really wrestling focused anyway, I've also been able to uh, make you know that show, in my opinion, the tightest, strongest set of shows we've ever done. And throughout Dynamite and Collision, I think there's been some really great things. There's great storytelling outside of the Continental Classic. I'm really excited about the world title matches. I think uh, for people, uh, you know, that it really want to see larger than life characters. There's great things uh, to be said for what's happening with the devil. Certainly Samoa Joe and MJF are two of the greatest wrestlers in the world. And I think to have a world title match like MJF versus Samoa Joe and for them to be able to tell a story, I think it's really exciting. And that has lived outside of uh, this great sports based presentation we've done. And certainly time with Tony storm has built herself into an amazing character. I've loved working on it. You know, I, I, it feels like a lifetime ago, and it, it was, a, it, honestly, it was a really long time ago. It was before, uh, it was right before I first started talking to Mariah, and it took a long time to get her visa done. So this is many, many months ago. I first went to Tony Storm and talked to her about uh, a changing character and watching uh, some films from the 50s, and, uh, and she sunk her teeth into it more than anybody's ever sunk their teeth into something. She talked about a perfect fit for somebody and she has taken the ball and run with it unlike anyone I've ever seen and timeless Tony Storm has been amazing but she really when you look back uh, at AEW now and what I'm talking about you know somebody who has had some of the best matches and certainly to get the best pro wrestling uh, week to week I think somebody that can go out there and from the very first dynamite not only have great matches, but we've also seen somebody that delivers ratings is Rio. So I think it's a very fascinating matchup, in particular with, you know, of course, by design, Rio got taken out by Ruby, Soraya, and Tony, and has come back for revenge, and she's gotten revenge on Ruby and Soraya. And I joke to all the women, I think this really reminds me of uh, Kill Bill, because it's like they all put this woman down, and she's come back for revenge, and this group... They don't even like each other, the individual people anymore. <laughs> like, you know, Tony's not even friends with them anymore, and they're fighting with each other. And, uh, and like, yet um, they all have that in common that, you know, Rio is coming for all of them. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, I you know, I've really enjoyed 
uh, working with them. And in particular, uh, you know, and, and, and certainly speaking of these big characters and at the, the house of black and Julia Hart is the TBS champion and Abaddon. So there's a lot of interesting things going on outside of the continental classic. And, and the focus on women's wrestling is very by design. I've been really trying to put an emphasis on more stories and as, because everybody's been stepping up and it's time and we have a great group that I've been trying to build and that a lot of injury. You know, it's really challenging for a wrestling promotion. It doesn't get talked about enough. When you have uh, people like Kenny Omega, Adam Cole, Pac on the men's side just to get started, I mean, you know, I think it could cripple a wrestling company pretty much any – I think it could cripple most wrestling companies when you say on the men's side you're going to lose Kenny Omega, Adam Cole, and Pac, and then Jamie Hayter, uh, Britt Baker, and Thunder Rosa on the women's side. I mean, it certainly – you know, for us a few years ago in the pandemic era, something like that would have completely uh, crippled the company to lose that, that volume of stars. Yet, uh, time after time, AEW wrestlers have stepped up. And, and mentioning those names in the women's division, it was great to get Thunder Rosa back. Again, part of the great collision show this past week that delivered a really strong number that's been up week after week after week, despite the competition only getting harder and harder with the NFL stepping in. And the women's division... Uh, has really leveled up, and I'm really excited about what they're doing. And so there's just a lot of things going on. So for your, to answer your question, I feel like more all over it than ever. I think the experiments we've been doing are working, and I have a better sense of where to go and what to do going into 2024 than I ever have before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. Dave Meltzer. From the Wrestling Observer is next. Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy will follow Dave. Dave, you're up. Hey, Dave. Well, again, maybe I've Stunned Dave with the uh, the depths of my answer there, but uh, um, it was. Let's uh, try and okay, Amy. Okay. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Are you there? Sorry. Okay. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tony. I just wanted to ask you. Um, you know, there's been um, several key people who are have either left or are leaving the company. Um, you know, when it comes to the, actually the end of this week, I think, um, with um, uh, Dana Massey and. Um, um, Raphael Morphy and um, QT, and also uh, I was going to ask what the status is of Mega. But um, so, do you have replacements set up for these? Because obviously, these are really major positions. You know, I mean, it's coincidental. Yeah, I have I have some pretty big I have some pretty big things to announce uh, going forward. And um, obviously, it's a lot of people I really value. You said a lot of great names. I mean, I could write a book on each of these people. I, I really value them. I think when you talk about uh, Dana. Raf and QT, each of them has been with us since the beginning and made huge contributions to the company. And, uh, well, you know, there's, uh, it's really very challenging uh, to, to, to have people like that uh, step away. But I, I think the company's growing, and I'm very excited about what we'll be doing in 2024. Um, I just, I think right before, you know, we, you asked, I just kind of wrote a, an, a, a book on the creative side in terms of giving a long answer about things I think that are, are strong and uh, some of uh, the uh, pro wrestling and some of the larger than life characters and uh, the mix of them and the, and, uh, the experiments we've been doing on the TV side and uh, I think what has been very successful. I believe that on the business side and on the operational side, the company continues to grow. I have certainly been looking at making more hires and growing the company and I'm working on stuff I'm really excited about. and. At the end of the year, of course, not unusual sometimes in businesses for contract things to expire December 31st at the end of the year and, and new cycles to start January 1st. And just like the name of the pay-per-view, this Saturday night, World's End, uh, it's going to be uh, uh, a, a new uh group and there'll be some new uh, things happening and I'm really excited about it. And um, I would be remiss not to say I'm really grateful for 
all the contributions of the people uh, you just mentioned. And, uh, you know, going forward, I think uh, we'll have uh, some exciting things to announce, and uh, I'm looking forward to that, but definitely working on some cool stuff uh, to try to continue growing the company, both on the wrestling side, most importantly, in my opinion, and on the business side. Thank you, Dave. Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy is next. Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone will follow Amy. Amy, go. Hi. Hi, Tony. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, hey. great. So I actually just shouted yes when they called my name because the way that this call um, has gone on and the information that you've given has sort of changed the questions that I wanted to ask you. I initially had a ton of facts and figures for the women's match is heading into it with neat storylines around it. But instead, what I'd like to ask you about is the women's division overall as a whole this year. It's really been on fire. You've got Athena, you've got Tony Storm, Riho, Julia Hart, Chris Statlander, Willow, Sky Blue, Soraya, Ruby, Sheeta. The list goes on. And of course, Abaddon heading into this TBS match at World's End. Can you talk about the changes in the booking for the women's division this year, as well as some of the standouts that you've had in storylines, character development, matches, etc.? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I hope I, well, I, thank you very much, Amy. I hope I don't uh, reiterate or run over any of the same things I was just talking about, because I, I, as I said, I was just complimenting some of that work uh, moments ago, and I feel really strongly about the work that the women are doing. We just recently had ROH final battle where Athena and Billy Starks tore the house down. And time after time, Athena has done that on pay-per-view. Athena in Ring of Honor has been a great wrestler, a great champion, and it's somebody who's capable of having great matches in any promotion in the world. And somebody I feel really, really strongly about. And then Billy Starks, of course, has had this amazing rise as an 18-year-old, now 19-year-old uh, star. And uh, I think Billy Starks is somebody who has achieved so much in a really quick time and uh, really love the work I've done with them uh, and the work they've done together on ROH. And then talking about AEW and focusing on this Saturday, World's End, really very proud of Timeless Tony Storm. And, and as I said, uh, to have somebody that has become a great champion and is a great wrestler, but has also quickly become one of my personal favorite characters on television. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a true statistic that AEW fans um, have very desirable demographics in terms of uh, being uh, above the median uh, TV viewer in terms of uh, income and, uh, and, uh, often uh, various demographics that are desirable to advertisers. So I think that uh, when you have one of the more highbrow characters in wrestling and you have something as unique as TCM's Ben Mankiewicz coming in and doing the introduction and giving it such a great effort and making it uh, a tremendous opening for Timeless Tony Storm, that's a great sign, in my opinion, and that TCM signs off and gives it their signature of approval with TCM being so prestigious. And, uh, of course, I mentioned Rio. Rio coming back uh, has always been a great wrestler for us. And whenever Rio is in America and in avail available to wrestle, I want to work her into the stories. And it was also why I felt strongly about the outcast at the time being the one to take out Rio so that, by the, you know, when Tony had had her transformation into timeless Tony Storm, we could have this great championship match, and Rio would be back for revenge against timeless Tony Storm to have this awesome match because Rio is somebody that has delivered at the box office for us time after time and always has great matches. And the crowd is behind. You heard that at Dynamite with the crowd chanting Rio, Rio. And then uh, talking about Julia Hart and Abaddon, uh, what a great TBS championship match. I think. Julia Hart has become one of the most interesting champions in wrestling, and I'm very excited this Saturday about her match with Abaddon. And when it comes to Abaddon, they've come back to AEW in much better condition and become 
a great part of the show, and I was really excited about their segment. I thought it was a, a great uh, a great way going into the pay-per-view to add some additional momentum into Abaddon and Julia Hart, which has been building for weeks and is a, a very exciting story. People are, like I said, excited to see Abaddon again. They've come back to AEW in great condition, and uh, it's somebody with a lot of potential, and I think Abaddon would be a great TBS champion, and they'll be facing a great TBS champion in Julia Hart, who has stepped up and done so well in the spot so far. And that's a match I'm really excited about. And then speaking of Julia Hart, it's something to keep an eye on now with Julia Hart's budding relationship with Sky Blue, which has been building for months. That story has been something to follow. That's in a great place. And then, of course, that all led to an exciting return also for Thunder Rosa, stepping out of the commentary desk, returning to the ring. So there's so many exciting things happening. And, and you mentioned some of the other great stars, Soraya and Ruby. Uh, interesting to follow what's next for them. And Harley, uh, maybe they're taking on a personal assistant. A lot of other great stars in the division, former world champions like Hikaru Shida and Nyla Rose, and a lot of other great wrestlers. Um, and last night I thought Chris Statlander, Sky Blue, was an excellent match. Chris Statlander, really excited about her. She's been a great TBS champion. Uh, and now something to follow, I think, uh, is Chris Statlander and Willow. I think they are great friends, and I think that would be a great one-on-one -on -one match to see. And then uh, I think Willow, in particular, has had an amazing year, winning the Owen Hart Foundation Tournament and uh, had a great match with Athena, tore the house down. And then we've seen Willow also tear the house down recently, speaking of Willow and Chris Statlander, against Mercedes and Diamante on collision in the street fight. So, so many great names, so many great fights happening in the women's division, which is in, I think, the strongest place it's been. And imagine how much better it's going to get because I plan uh, to be very active in free agency and we have great names coming back like Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, and Jamie Hayter, great world champion who was the top star in the division at the time she was injured and certainly going back to Wembley Stadium London this year that's going to be so huge for us potentially getting Jamie Hayter back in the division which I believe right now is in the strongest place it's ever been and when we get those big stars back and uh, if I am as active in free agency as I have the ability to be then I think things can get really exciting thank you thank you Amy Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone is next, and he will be followed by Amir Rahman from Power 88.1 FM in Vegas. Bill. Hey, Tony. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. I'm excited for the pay-per-view. How are you? I, I'm equally as excited. Uh, I had a question <laughs> about Kenny Omega. Obviously, the injury uh, impacted the tag match that it looked like it was building to. Uh, can you speak to how much it had an impact on the rest of the card and if it moved up Sammy Guevara's return at all? It affected a lot of things. It affected a lot of stuff. When you lose a star like Kenny Omega, the dominoes start to drop, and that's a great, great question, and it's something people don't think about as much, that when there's an effect on things that can affect people all over the show in different places, so I think that's very uh, intuitive. And uh, Sammy is somebody we're really excited about. And, of course, Sammy has a lot of a great history uh, to mine. And uh, there's always something to be said for having a, a huge star like Sammy Guevara returning from injury. And we've got so much to celebrate uh, with Ty and Sammy and the birth of Luna. And uh, very excited for them. And... Uh, and when it comes to Kenny Omega, you know, I think your instincts uh, are, are tremendous. There's a, there, it does change things a lot. And what I'm excited about is how strong the card is and how many great things there are when you look at a pay-per-view that has, uh, you know, so many things like uh, top to bottom and, and these huge matches, of course, like we've talked a lot about the Condell Classic and to get to the, the final with Moxley and Kingston and, and this great card top to bottom with, uh, you know, with some MJF versus Samoa Joe for the world title and, and Tony Storm versus Rio, Abaddon versus 
uh, Julia Hart, Christian Cage versus Adam Copeland, and uh, so many more big matches, but certainly throughout the card, then the effects were felt. So it's uh, good timing uh, for the AEW roster to step up, and very excited to have uh, eight-man tag uh, coming up with the Don Callis family, Ricky Starks and Big Bill, all of whom I think are tremendous wrestlers, deserve the spot, uh, stepping into the ring with Sting, Darby Allen, Chris Jericho, and now Sammy Guevara. I think that's really exciting, and it does, you know, it, it, it is something that obviously was impacted because originally we had planned for Chris Jericho to team with Kenny Omega versus Starks and Big Bill, but um, with Kenny Omega not there, I don't think, you know, frankly, you're not going to try and put anybody to fill Kenny Omega's shoes. Nobody's, nobody can do that. Kenny, There's only one Kenny Omega. And so I thought the right thing to do would be to change the card and rebuild things and try to do something to cover uh, it in an exciting way. And instead of uh, one partner for Chris Jericho with Kenny Omega, he's got three partners with uh, – the, the band he's teamed with and been with since the very first episode of Dynamite, the longest uh, continuous partnership uh, that's formed since that first episode probably would be Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara uh, uh, until this year. And, uh, of course, with uh, Don's family uh, kind of uh, casting Sammy aside, forgetting about him, not uh, really, you know, shown – uh, the love to him and his family and uh, casting him out and, you know, made sense uh, to me that he would be somebody uh, who could be a, a great partner for Chris, but also instead of just trying to go to um, right into a tag match, which to me, I, like I said, I don't, I don't, I would never try to just put somebody into to a like for like replacement because there is no like for like replacement for a, a Kenny Omega. Um, best thing to do to me is to not have Sammy, but also to bring in, Darby and, of course, Sting, and now get more people involved. But also this can uh, be a great moment for the fans in New York because this will be for uh, a lot of fans uh, in the state of New York. This will be the last chance to see Sting. So uh, I'm very excited about that. And I think there's a lot of things on the top to bottom about this card, really, that uh, I'm thrilled about. But certainly the, one of the things I'm not thrilled about was that we lost Kenny Omega off the card, and I think everybody's done a great job to step up, and, and thankfully we have a great legend like Sting in the chamber uh, to come in and, uh, and and help us switch things around. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Amir Rahman from Power 88.1 FM in Las Vegas is next to be followed uh, by Chris Mueller from the Bleacher Report. Amir uh, hi. Hi, Tony. You know, I was there at Grand Slam. One thing we've seen is you know how to dance. You did do the dance with uh, Daniel Garcia. My question is, is that, you know, all in happened in London. You guys had 81,035 attendance with other wrestling companies doing shows in Puerto Rico and France. Are you looking to have another pay-per-view, not in London, but say in France as well and Germany? Or are you just focus right now at, at um, London for all in? Well, we're very focused on London for all in. And I think it's really important to have the attendance from fans all over Europe. And you mentioned France and Germany, and we had many fans from France and Germany. I talked to them. Uh, not every single one I wasn't able to speak to, but I talked to a lot of them around that weekend, around Wembley. And there were people from all over the world, including uh, a lot of the great European fans who came to Wembley Stadium, which is, in my opinion, the mecca of sport. And it's certainly a very exciting opportunity for AEW to visit France and Germany and do shows and tour. I think it's important for us to also represent uh, to everybody what it meant to us to have uh, fans from all over the world attending at Wembley Stadium and what the multi-million dollar gates represent. You know, uh, we're, we had a, a gate of... Uh, Ten million dollars for this event, and it gets lost in perspective sometimes. But it's such a an important milestone in wrestling to do a one million dollar gate, to do a ten million dollar gate. It's ten one million dollar gates in one night. 
It's $5,200,000 gate in one night. And the $200,000 gate is a pretty good house. It looks good on TV. It's a good, big, good crowd. And uh, so um, I think it's uh, pretty historic what we've been able to do in London. And now to go back again and have – all in 2024 be in such a great place now and have ballpark 5 million in tickets already for an event that is, you know, uh, still eight months away. It's pretty cool. And uh, tickets continue uh, to sell and the excitement continues to build for AEW all in Wembley Stadium. I think the uh, eyes of the pay-per-view world this weekend are going to be on AEW World's End. And uh, certainly... We'll, we'll keep advertising, pushing London Wembley Stadium. And to us, it's really important to have the support of the fans from France and Germany. Certainly, they are great markets for us to tour and and try to take that next step potentially in the future. But I think there's a lot of focus right now trying to make sure that our return to London is very successful because that's been a, a great step for us. And certainly... In, not only in just my opinion, but I think the history books will show what we've been able to build in London is one of the greatest achievements in the history of pro wrestling. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. <clears throat> okay, with the five minutes we have remaining, we've got Chris Mueller from Bleacher Report, and we're going to end it with Jim Barcelona from the Miami Herald. Chris? Hey, Tony, can you hear me? I hear you great. All right, great. So, looks like we're finally going to get to see Swerve and Keith Lee step into the ring and kind of settle things here. I was wondering if you could talk about why it took so long to get to this match and whether there were any challenges you dealt with along the way of getting this booked. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the right time because now Swerve, it, first of all, for both of them, I'll start with the, just because last night the Connell Classic Gold League Final I thought was one of the best matches ever on the show in addition to the Blue League Final which is also one of the best matches ever on the show and to have all that in one night it's pretty amazing and across these past few weeks it's been some incredible wrestling and Swerve on Dynamite in the Gold League has been tearing the house down pun intended, it, it, it has been Swerve's house and he has torn it down. And he continues to rise and rise as a star in wrestling. I'm very excited about the match. And in particular, the timing of it is by design. We've been trying to build both men. I think Swerve has had this meteoric rise, unlike anybody in AEW or anyone in pro wrestling. It has been very organic. And he has earned the position. Last night, we were in the venue where Swerve debuted. In turn, he had his first ever AEW appearance. He arrived in Orlando at Revolution 22 in the same arena. So when I first saw Swerve, when I first walked up to him, you know, I remember uh, being in that arena with him. And it was the first time we'd ever worked together, I, even though we'd met outside of the arena when I talked to him about signing him because he's somebody I felt really strong with. And Keith Lee, somebody also feel really, really strongly about. Keith Lee, tremendous presence. I'm really excited that he has had this resurgence. And he had a great match with Brian Cage recently. He's had a series of great matches. I've been so enthusiastic about AEW Collision. And Keith Lee being presented regularly on Collision is something I love and something uh, that has been very successful for the show. When you look at, as I mentioned, the great ratings growth we've had and the great success of uh, Collision in recent weeks rising in the ratings despite the competition getting undisputedly tougher and tougher with the specter of the National Football League appearing. And I think that Keith Lee is a, a great star, and Keith and Swerve had been a tremendous, tremendous tag team and they were involved in some of my favorite matches, including when they wrestled the acclaimed and, and when, and when they first won the titles at dynamite. 
I think Keith and Swerve together were a force. It's a match people have wanted to see. I joke to people, it's like uh, it, it's something I have in the chamber for when I need it, like the Sopranos with the Russian, except the Sopranos never, you never actually found the Russian uh, in the woods. Now, that might have been for the best uh, to leave him in the Pine Barrens, leave it a mystery. In this case, I really wanted to do the match, and it's something you keep in the chamber for when you need it, because for us, coming out of the Continental Classic, Swerve is on fire, and I thought it would be perfect to go into World's End with Keith building the chase. He's had these great matches recently. We didn't know who him was, even though I think we all suspected who him was. And, you know, he's been talking about him, and we've seen Keith have, go to the incredible Ring of Honor final battle show, which was such a tremendous event. Keith, of course, is from Texas, has a great history in Ring of Honor, and in particular has a great history with Shane Taylor. So I thought Keith and Shane Taylor had a, an excellent match, and we found out that Shane Taylor still wasn't the one Keith was looking for. And then Keith had this tremendous match with Brian Cage on a really successful show on a great collision. And again, Brian Cage wasn't the person he was looking for in the end. I think when you remember, it was there in San Antonio, speaking of buildings with significance, it was there in San Antonio where Swerve had put Keith out with the cinder block. So looking at the schedule and building out the calendar, knowing where we were at with the Continental Classic that's going into World's End this week, and also uh, realizing Swerve and Keith where they're at. That this has been a resurgence for Keith, and Swerve is on this meteoric rise. Both guys really have been doing tremendous, and, and for the company, it's a great time uh, to go to the match coming out of the Continental Classic and uh, with Keith having some great matches recently, with Swerve having some great matches recently, both of them looking for the dance partner, but also by design. Uh, frankly, I think that the timing is right because had I gone to this match at another time and place, uh, I wouldn't do anything differently in terms of what we've done with Swerve. I think it's been perfect. I wouldn't change a thing. He's uh, perfect. And so now uh, I believe he faces the toughest test and a test we've been looking forward to for a long time, and it's built interest. And uh, I think certainly it's a match I've wanted to see for a really long time. They have faced off before in tag team competition, They've and they've teamed up, but this will be the first one-on-one -on -one match, and fans have really been looking forward to it. And uh, I'm excited about Keith and Swerve facing off on Saturday this weekend at World's End. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Tony, we're at time. Do you have uh, time, though, to, to take care of Jim Barcelon from the Miami Herald? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please. Okay. I appreciate Jim, it. Jim, you're going to wrap it up for us. Jim, you're up. You ready to go? Yes, thank you all. A very good show last night in Orlando. Live crowd was really good. Uh, I want to ask, you mentioned Continental Classic, obviously, big thing at World's End. And I'm curious with the success that you've talked about with it and even some of the uh, ratings numbers with it, is this something now that you'll look at, hey, let's try this with a women's Continental Classic? Well, absolutely. I think I, well, there's different types of presentation. I think I've, I've talked a lot on this call about why I think the Continental Classic has been a great presentation and also why uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of reasons why a lot of, uh, a lot of our top women have really stepped up and we're having a lot of great success recently. And I think there's been a lot of folks I've tried to put on uh, our women's wrestling and focusing on the biggest strengths of the people in the division and you know working in the NFL you see this week to week scheming in games and people trying to focus on what the strengths of their players are and focusing on the weaknesses of their opponents and I believe it's really important thing to do and I think for this focusing on uh, the strengths of our wrestlers and the strengths of our wrestling program, the Continental Classic has been a huge success. And I think we've had a lot of uh, success 
outside of the Continental Classic. And one of the things people had really enjoyed outside of the Continental Classic, in addition to the, all the great wrestling they've gotten week to week in this Continental Classic tournament, has been the development, growth, and the momentum that the AEW Women's Division has right now going into this Saturday's World End pay-per-view. I intend to keep it going, and I'm very excited about it myself. I really believe it's very tangible and real. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, there's a lot of exciting possibilities out there. Uh, and uh, I will continue trying to develop all the talent. And uh, the Condo Classic has been a rousing success. And outside of the Condo Classic, I think uh, I'm going to try to continue what I think has been really successful to nurture and develop and grow and now build this great heat momentum around the women's division of AEW. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Tony, we are at time. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Thank you, Jim. Uh, yes, I really appreciate all of you very much. I, coming to the end of the year, this is the first time we've done this, the holiday week. I appreciate everybody joining us uh, during the holiday week. This is uh, a special time of the year. I wanted to add a wrestling show, uh, even though for some of us it means more work. It, for a lot of people, it'll mean another nice experience at home more time watching wrestling, either uh, alone, and it gives them something to do around the holidays, but also for a lot of people who like watching wrestling with their friends and family, like I was growing up, it gives uh, an, another reason to have your friends over during winter break and watch a big show this Saturday, like AEW World End, with so many great things to look forward to. And uh, I really appreciate all of you coming and covering it, as I said, during the holiday week, giving us your time. I hope uh, this was somewhat enlightening. And uh, for anybody I did not get to, I tried to, to answer as many as I could and stay with you here and, and, and give uh, good answers whenever possible. And I think that your questions, uh, I really appreciated you uh, all being here and asking such great questions. And if there's anybody I didn't get to who's available, I'd love to see you at World's End. And I'll stay as long as I can, try to answer everybody's questions for everybody who comes to the event. And uh, again, very grateful, and uh, I hope for all of you celebrated. Uh, you had a great Christmas. I know I really enjoyed it uh, at home with my family, and I hope uh, all of you had a great holiday season. And uh, wish you all a happy new year, and hopefully see a lot of you this weekend at AEW World's End on Saturday on Long Island. Thank you very much. Yeah.